Now, before we fully move on to classifiers, let's take a moment to go over the theory of making decisions and think about when we consider a classifier to be a good classifier. Now, the setting is uh, we have these input vectors, uh, which come from some uh, d-dimensional vector space, and we have corresponding ground truth targets, so which I'm going to note with t. So my target uh, belongs to one out of uh, let's say k classes. Now I'm going to, what I'm essentially doing with the classifier, I'm going to divide the input space, so my d-dimensional uh, input space, into k decision regions, right? So I'm partitioning it with these k regions where k runs from 1 uh, to capital K. So I have k of these regions, and whenever a point f lies within this region, I'm going to say, well, this data point uh, belongs to class k. Okay, then I can validate how well my classifier is performing, right? Because for every data point, I have a ground truth uh, denoted with uh, a TN that says, okay, it belongs to class K, and I have a prediction. I have a prediction, uh, let's denote it with T hat N, and it says belongs to class K. Uh, let's use a J index for uh, my ground truth. Um, well, because these could be different, right? Um, and I make this decision essentially because I observe that my data point X falls within region K. Okay, so for every uh, data point in my validation set, I have a ground truth and a uh, prediction. And that allows me to build a confusion matrix. So this confusion matrix really uh, identifies all the different type of errors that I'm making, but also how many times I was correct in my uh, predictions. So really I'm going to check um, what if my classifier says it belongs to class one, and then I'm going to check how many times it actually corresponded to class one. So the ground truth is uh, class one. So this will be a correct prediction, but sometimes I classify it as a class one, but it actually belonged to class two. So I make an error here. So I make five of these errors in this example, and I make two of these errors for class K. And um, so that tells me that in such a uh, confusion matrix, the diagonal el uh, elements are correctly classified predictions. So my classifier said it belongs to a uh, class one and my ground truth says the same. My classifier said it belongs to a uh, class two and my classifier says the same. So all these diagonal elements are correct predictions. And that means actually that all the off diagonal elements were misclassifications, right? So for example, here, my classifier said uh, this data point belonged to class two, whereas actually it belonged to class one. And so all these off diagonal elements are incorrect uh, pred predictions. So these are errors, misclassifications, all right? So again, these columns are uh, given the class, the class is given by the classifier, the classifier, uh, essentially, so the T hats that I'm predicting, and then I'm going to check the corresponding ground truths and count how many times this combination of occurs of a correct classification or maybe a prediction class two, uh, ground truth class one. Okay, now, so with this given, let's think about um, what would then be uh, an optimal classifier, right? So my classification goal would be to uh, minimize the classification rate. So really I want to minimize the number of errors that I make on these off diagonal uh, elements. Okay, so that's my objective. And now I'm going to move on to this uh, probabilistic viewpoint. Um, I'm going to assume that my data was sampled from some joint uh, probability distribution. And in the next slide, I'm going to um, give a particular example of such a distribution, but essentially it says, uh, what is the likelihood of observing or probability of observing an X, a particular input with the corresponding a uh, class. Okay, so, um, well, my data set is generated from basically sampling from this uh, distribution. So we assume there exists such a joint uh, distribution that describes the data. Then we can talk about the probability of a misclassification. And a probability of such a mistake is really given by summing over all my uh, possible mistakes that I can make. Um, and that's given in this, uh, this formula, right? So um, we make a mistake whenever we, my data points falls in region I. Uh, so my classifier says, well, this belongs to class I, but my classifier says it belongs to class K. So I'm considering all the cases where K is unequal to I. 
So this is really essentially summing over all the different mistakes that I can make. But now the type of mistakes that I make are not just counted, like in this sort of frequency setting, but I'm going to just, um, well, well, take the, the probabilities of making these mistakes from my joint probability distribution. Okay, so that would give me an overall probability of making a mistake. And we're talking about a probability series, so that means that this probability of making a mistake is actually one minus the probability of making a correct prediction, right? So, and a correct prediction was um, all probability of all cases where X light in region K and my classifier also said um, it belonged to class K. Okay, so if I know such a joint probability distribution, then my objective really would be to minimize the probability of making a mistake, to really find the region for the regions, these classification regions for which uh, this probability of making a mistake is uh, minimized. So that really means that if I make a new observation X, then I want to make my decision for the class K based on the idea that for this particular data point, the probability of it belonging to class K, well, it should be higher than the probability for X um, belonging to any of the other classes, right? So for every J unequal to K. So really I'm going to select a class which maximizes uh, this joint probability. Because if I do this, this term will be maximized, uh, which means one minus uh, my positive predictions really reduces uh, the number of mistakes that I make, the probability of making a mistake. So this is my goal. I'm going to minimize the classification rate by, cl by selecting, well, the, the highest probable uh, class. Okay, now um, using the product rules of probability, we know that this joint probabilities of uh, X and the corresponding class uh, can be split in the following way, right? So we have a, uh, what we call a posterior class probability. So after observing X, what would uh, the probability for C be uh, times uh, the prior for X? So the overall probability of observing such an X. Okay, so we can do this, right? Uh, and then if we're going to make these kind of comparisons, then of course this term, which doesn't depend on my class probabilities, uh, it will not uh, influence my decision making. So this means that eventually, well, in the end, I'm primarily interested in these posterior class probabilities given my observation X. Okay, so my uh, strategy for classification will be, I'm going to check for the largest, for the largest posterior class probabilities. So I'm going to really compare the posterior class probability for my class K, um, given my observation X, and I want it to be larger than all the other um, classes uh, CJ, so for all J unequal to K. Okay, so you know we're already moving towards this probabilistic setting, so maybe a good way uh, to build your classifiers would be to uh, approximate or to recover these kind of posterior uh, distributions uh, in the end to make your, well, to base your classifications on. But um, for now, let's just focus on the type of errors that we make, given that our data is drawn from a joint probability distribution. Okay, so what does that mean? So suppose we know the joint probability distribution that generated our data, and I'm going to build a classifier that splits my input axis X into two regions. So I'm now considering a 1D uh, example, 1D data point X. Um, and this region is really split by placing a threshold or a decision boundary, which I'm going to indicate with X hat. Um, well, such that when X is higher than this X hat, I'm going to classify the data point as belonging to class two. And whenever it's lower, I'm going to say it belongs to class one. Then let's see what kind of errors we make. And we're talking about joint probability distribution. So I made this figure over here, um, which we can really consider as a 2D uh, probability distribution, right? Where with respect to X, X is a continuous variable. So I have this uh, density uh, and I have two of these densities. So along my C axis, I have two discrete options. So C is either class one or C is class two. So that essentially gives me these two conditional uh, probability densities, right? One for class one, one for class two. And there may be overlap in the two. And that's what we're going to uh, focus on now. Okay, so let's think about what errors we make when we draw, let's say, our decision boundary is somewhere over here. So this is my X hat. So this means that everything on this side 
will be classified as class 2 and everything on this side will be classified as class 1. Okay, so have these uh, decision boundaries. Now suppose my uh, data point came from this part of the distribution, so it actually claim came from class 1, then um, well, whenever it came from this part, I'm making a correct prediction, right? Because I'm, say that I'm saying that it came from class 1 and it indeed came from class 1. But everything on this side, so this, will be uh, an error because my classifier, based on this decision boundary, says it belongs to class 2, whereas actually all data points which were drawn from this part of the distribution um, actually belong to class 1. Okay? So these predictions are then wrong. Now let's take a look at the other part of this uh, distribution where, um, well, my data points actually belong to class two. Um, then what happens in this region? So in this region, I classify everything as class two. So that's actually correct. I do not make any mistakes over here, but all this region, so this, is all going to be classified as uh, class one, where actually points drawn from this part of the distribution will belong to class two. So these are again errors. So this is wrong given my decision boundary. Okay, and now it's important to realize that actually we're always going to make mistakes, right? Because, well, at least if there's overlap between these uh, conditional distributions. So that's nicely visualized if you view this from the front. So we really view this from the front and that gives me this figure. And this figure uh, comes from the book of Bishop. Okay, so I just mentioned, uh, well, this part of the distribution, so the class one part of the distribution is visualized over here. And we say we're going to make mistakes whenever uh, a data point falls above this threshold. So it's classified as region two. Whereas for the other part of the distribution, so the class two part, uh, I'm not going to make mistakes here, but I'm going to make, make mistakes on this part. So this red part actually, well, what I draw over here extends, uh, well, down here, um, but we have overlap. So actually we have a part of mistakes that we cannot do anything about. Uh, we, we're bound to make mistakes because, well, sometimes I observe a data point over here, which actually belongs to class one and sometimes I observe a data point which actually belongs uh, to class two. So I'm bound to make mistakes, uh, but there are some mistakes uh, which I uh, can actually reduce. I have influence over this. And that is really indicated with this red part in this figure. So this region can actually be reduced by moving this decision boundary to the left, right? So uh, here my probability for really my true probability of observing class two is higher than my probability of class one. So overall, uh, it's, it's wiser to, to classify this entire region as belonging to region 2. And so we see that this type of error shrinks when we move the decision boundary uh, to this point, which we note, uh, denote with x0. So x0 is really the optimal decision boundary. And it's precisely this point where uh, the probability for x given class 1 equals the probability for x and class 2. Okay, so this again tells us if we're going to build a classifier, uh, maybe it would be a good strategy to focus on trying to recover these joint probability distributions because then we can really define the optimal decision boundary. Okay, uh, but then there's a very important remark to make here. So we identified the different type of errors that we make and we came up with a solution on how to minimize the type of errors overall. But in practice, not all errors have the same impact. And this is very important to take into account. Uh, consider, for example, this example of uh, the medical diagnosis of cancer. Um, so in this process, we can make uh, two types of errors, right? So either we're going to label a healthy person as having cancer. Now, this is problematic, pro problematic because, uh, well, this uh, induces a lot of stress to this patient. It's expensive and it might actually do more harm than good. So this is an error that you do not want to make. Um, but similarly, uh, we have an other type of error. Uh, we could label a sick person as being healthy. And if, I, if we make this decision, then this person does not receive treatment and this person could actually die. So uh, this is also a very uh, terrible mistake that you can make. And so... Now, generally, I, would, I, I guess people would argue that the error two is the most important error to reduce. So um, 
well, some errors are more important than others. And we want to take this into account in our uh, modeling framework, in our classification framework. And how to do this, I'm going to show in the next slide. But then there's also another issue, and that uh, has to do with class imbalance. Uh, Suppose the following, suppose that a cancer only occurs in 1% of all patients. Then if I just make a classifier which classifies everybody as healthy, uh, then my classification rate or my misclassification rate will only be 1%. So if you look at it this way, um, well, you could actually say I'm actually, I came up with a very decent classifier because I only make 1% errors. Uh, so this really gives us a, a skewed view of uh, well, performance. So class imbalance is also something that you really need to take into, into account when you make your classification uh, algorithms. Okay, so there's two aspects that you really should remember to pay attention to. And that's uh, one, not all errors have the same impact. So some errors are more important than others. And we have class imbalance, class imbalance that we want to uh, take into account. Now, a possible solution, actually a common solution uh, to this is to assign different weights to different type of errors. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And so we can make this matrix L, which really assigns the weights, uh, like the penalties, or really a discrete loss uh, of making a particular decision. So I can make different types of errors or combination of predictions versus ground truth. So let's say uh, this is my ground truth. So I predict the person has cancer and it has cancer. So then I'm not going to assign any loss because I did a good job. But I could also uh, predict uh, the, pa the, the patient as being healthy, where actually uh, the patient had cancer. So this is a, a terrible mistake to make. So I'm going to penalize this a lot uh, with a factor 1000, let's say. Um, of course, also we can label a person as having cancer and uh, whereas the person actually was healthy. So this is a mistake. Of course, I do not want to mistake, uh, make, but I'm not going to penalize it as, as, harsh, as, as harshly as uh, this mistake. So I'm just going to assign it a penalty one because maybe this type of, type of errors can be picked up later in the process of treating this patient. Um, and then also if I make a predict, uh, a correct prediction for the person being healthy, then that's also fine. I'm not going to penalize this. Okay, so really we, we've characterized my loss into one matrix because I have a, a discrete set of mistakes that I can make. And so this really uh, characterizes all the losses. And then again, given my um, joint probability, then I can compute an expected loss. And this would be really um, summing over all possible combinations of ground root and classification, uh, integrating over all my regions uh, X within a region, right? Because the probability of X falling in region RJ and thus a probability of X being classified as class J is given by this integral over X in this region. Okay, so I'm going to make an error when X falls in region J, whereas my classifier says uh, it's region K. So I'm going to make errors uh, whenever J un equals K. And the overall probability of X uh, falling in region RJ is simply given by the integral, right, uh, over this region. Okay, so my strategy then would be, uh, so I come up with a classifier that really minimizes this overall expected loss. And this means that whenever a new data point X com comes in, I'm going to assign it to the class K, uh, such that uh, this probability of for the loss is minimized, right, because for each so I'm going to make errors. Uh, I can expect to make errors because I have overlap. I could have overlap between uh, the classes for a given point X, right? For, suppose I s select this point X, then I still have a probability for sampling class one or class two. And then this sum over all the combinations KJ would give me the probability of making this overall uh, mistake. Okay, so again, this means if we know this joint probability distribution, then we know how to reduce the number of errors. And we can also assign different uh, penalties to the type of errors that, we, uh, that we're going to make. So what we've discussed so far will be called decision theory, right? So given uh, my data is generated from this uh, probability distribution, uh, the theory tells us that this, this is the way how we should make uh, decisions. Okay, 
Now, with that said, we can, uh, can come up with several classification strategies. Uh, one is to really define a direct mapping of the input to the target T. So we could do that, right? So we could, could build a model which takes as input as X and it's parameterized by a set of weights W and it returns uh, one out of these uh, K classes. So it predicts a target. Um, this is sort of like a regression, uh, which we've seen so far. And now in this setting, it does not take on any probabilistic interpretation. So that means we're, when we optimize these kind of discriminant functions, uh, we do not rely on probability theory. We're just going to reduce some error functions, which may be derived heuristically. Okay, so this approach will be uh, done via so-called discriminant function. So really to discriminate between classes, uh, well, in a discriminative setting. So the only thing they do is uh, make distinction between classes given some, some model. Uh, then we can also consider probabilistic discriminative models. So this means that we're actually going to directly model the posterior class probabilities, CK given X. So we're really going to model this uh, via this probability distribution. And if we treat it as a probability distribution, then we can rely on these, uh, well, on decision theory and come up with ways of what would be uh, the correct classifier. That would actually mean that I'm going to, in the end, find, select a class uh, for which this posterior probability is highest, essentially. Okay, so we call this a probabilistic discriminative model because the objective is still purely to make this uh, discrimination or this classification between uh, data points. Uh, but now instead of modeling this directly with a discriminant function, we're going to model this uh, with, a, with a posterior class probability. So we're going to parameterize these distributions in some way. Okay, but then we can also move on to the fully probabilistic setting. And that requires us to model two things. So the class conditional density, so the probability of X given my class K. Uh, so that really means that suppose my data point belongs to the K class, what is the probability of observing this uh, particular X? Uh, and then if we also know the prior class uh, probabilities, so really the prior probability of observing a particular class at all, then these together will give me the joint uh, probability, right? So uh, we know that from the product rule. So first of all, this allows us to derive the joint probability of X and CK via the uh, class conditional probability of X given CK times the prior uh, probability for observing any class at all. But then for decision making, we actually want to base our decision uh, on the posterior class probabilities. And this can of course also be derived from this uh, via Bayes rule. So the posterior probability for a given class, given my observation X is given by X given CK. So my class conditional density times the prior for CK normalized with uh, the evidence, so the probability of observing just a particular X at all. Okay, so this probabilistic generative methods is the most, well, general class then of this, in, within these classification strategies, because we have full knowledge over, uh, well, that, what, that's what we try to recover. We try to recover the full knowledge over the joint probability distribution. And uh, we can do that via the class conditional densities and the priors, and this could give us access to the joint probability distribution which we could run in a generative setting, right? So from, if we know the joint probability distribution, we can just sample new data points from this. And this could be interesting if you want to generate new data, maybe in the case when you, when you have to deal with missing data, for example. Um, but more importantly, in the, the sense of classification and decision-making, this also gives you direct access to the uh, posterior class uh, probabilities. Okay, so we identify these three strategies for making decision. The first one is a discriminative method. So I do not resort to any probabilistic interpretation. I'm just going to come up with a model that directly maps my input to the corresponding target. Then I have a probabilistic discriminative model. So really I'm only focusing on making the right decision and I'm going to do that by model um, the posterior class probabilities because then I know how to make optimal decisions. And then finally, we have the probabilistic generative methods, um, which 
um, allow for retrieving the post year class probabilities. So really this means we know nicely how to make our decisions, but we also have this nice property that we can run the models in a generative way to generate new uh, data points. Now in the upcoming videos, we will uh, cover all three of these methods, but we start off with this probabilistic uh, generative method. So we still, we're going to stay in this probabilistic uh, setting uh, for the time being.